I was wondering uh, your views about whether uh, big data and machine learning will make this literature relevant. You know, uh, Amazon, Google, Netflix seems to be much better at knowing the preferences than myself sometimes. I can easily think of an app where you put the relevant characteristics and the app makes the choice for you. And another uh, uh, question I have is uh, uh, there seems to be some similarity with the ambiguity aversion uh, literature where the overloading information is measured, uh, is, is modeled with uh, uh, a set of priors instead of unique priors. And I'm wondering whether you can spell out the connection between this and that literature. Um, you, you started your presentation saying that um, it might be optimal um, uh, for us to uh, observe what the neighbors are doing uh, and that uh, herding might be optimal. What happens in a world where people are very different? So my neighbors are very different from, from me. Uh, how does your, what would your model predict uh, for um, information and herding? Uh, so the, the type of information cost that you put down here, you didn't use these words, but it's relative entropy. And relative entropy information costs have the feature that the more that you know, the cheaper it is to get additional units of precision. So I think this is what's driving herding in your model, because you already know what it is that other people have done. And so then that makes it easier to learn more about the products that other people have experienced that you've already seen the high market share for. So my first question is, is, is that right? Is that what's going on? And then second, if so, do we think that that's actually a good representation of human cognition? Like, I know you guys have thought a lot about this in a lab, but, but it's different from saying people learn about options that are valuable to learn about and test that feature of rational inattention. And there's this particular form of payoff to additional units of information that have this diminishing marginal cost. And that seems really important in this model, so I'd like for you to comment. So just so we first give you and then we have a second round. So that actually would be useful because then things are in my mind. Hello? Okay. So let me just start with actually let's go in reverse order. No and no. Um, okay. So <laughs> so that's not what's going on because what's happening is the watching other people is shifting the prior. Right? And so having more prior over here is unlikely to make you go less I mean, pretty much anything with, an, with a non-infinite marginal cost of learning, starting in this area direction, and you know, you tend to, you know, go more in that direction. Just think about convex adjustment costs or something like that. It's it's basically we're shifting the prior, and that's what's generating the herding. You see other people do it, you think it's likely that's a good idea, and therefore you start from the premise that it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea, and then you learn from there. And so that's kind of, but you're, the other bit you said, so it's not what's going on here, but you're perfectly right that Shannon entropy is probably not a universal model of information cost functions in the sense that, uh, I mean, they don't even, even in the physics literature, they've moved to other type of entropies, like Telus entropy, in which um, you can have things getting more or less difficult to learn as the situation becomes a little bit more complex or not. So you're trying to learn about two independent random variables. If they're in Shannon, the cost of learning about them together or separately is exactly the same, but in TELUS it could be bigger or less. It's essentially the CES extension of the PLNP. So, and, and there's a lot of people who are thinking along those lines. Woodford is uh, doing a lot with different types of information cost functions uh, with the correlations and what you learn and the signals and you know, definitely um, you know, different sorts of things. So that's definitely where things are going, but it's not, what, but, so it's no and no. Um, neighbors are very different. So right now, we don't have anything about our, I mean, just the type. And we don't have space in the model, so we don't have neighbors. We just have a bunch of people distributed with certain types. If, 
And, and essentially, our model is about you see a bunch of people in, a, in, in, in doing something, and you're saying, am I like them or am I not? You know, you see, a, I'm going to use restaurants, just an easier example. You see a lot of people in a restaurant. You look around, and are these my people or are they some other people? You know, lots of popular restaurants serve food that I detest. Um, and you're always trying to back out who the other people are. And so that's a fundamental, that's in the model. But what you were saying was adding another dimension to it. Like, is there a, the group around me different than like the whole population? And that we, we don't do, but could easily be done. Yeah. I'm like now in a, in a different country where people do completely different things, different customs, different standards. Yeah, uh, we don't do that, but it's, you know, conceivable. Um, ambiguity aversion. Ambiguity aversion is essentially the same thing as robust control. And robust control is like this, but without rational expectations, in which you get to choose, use this information constraint and you choose your beliefs in order to maximize the worst case outcome. And that is mathematically equivalent to, um, to uh, um, Epstein's in, which is a form of ambiguity aversion. So this is different in the sense that I know that the outcome of the math is completely different. It's the same in the sense that we have multiple posteriors on the table and are choosing about them, but we don't have any of the risk aversion type of things that pop out of robust control um, in what we're doing. It's purely Bayes' rule, and that's the constraint that, tie, that means whenever I learn, I pop out to a bunch of posteriors, but the big mathematical complication complications, they all have to satisfy Bayes' rule, which is what makes robust control so much easier mathematically, um, and that Sims, Hansen, and Sargent could write like a 500-page book in like a year. Um, big data. There are a couple of problems with big data. One is they need an input. They need to know people, they need to see people making choices in order to know how to interpret the stuff they see. If everybody's just being told what to do, then nobody's doing anything and you can't know anything, which is why a lot of these computer programs, these mapping programs, send people on incorrect routes. Small fraction of people have to be sent on bad routes to make sure that those are bad routes because they need to know if everyone's sent, you know, on Interstate 94, then you have no idea what Airport Road looks like, and so you have to send somebody there and get them stuck, and then big find out. So there's like really, comp you need to have an input. You can't have Amazon and Google telling you everything to do because then they lose their source of information. Our social learning came from the private information was reflected in the market shares and then you had something to learn from. You need to, it's a complicated problem. And to optimally, you know, sample to figure things out. Even Google has a big data problem. Um, let's see. Um, I think that, that uh, Bertos raised two really important points. The second one, I think, is more important than the first. And, and <laughs> no, it's less a criticism of me than it is of the literature. And that is that in all of these rational expectations, rational inattention models, we have no way of differentiating what is easy to learn and what is hard to learn. There's just this learning cost, and there's just this land in front. So everything is the same difficulty to learn. And so the way people handle this is, you know, Laura has you see the stock price, and then you're learning about fundamentals. We have you, you know, see market share, and then you're learning about your type. Bertosch, in his paper with Mirko Wielerholt, has people um, seeing their consumption, their you know, interest rates, you know, everything, they just can't, they learn about prices and marginal cost. And so we don't really have a way of, we want people who are learning about all of these things, but we actually think people know certain things pretty well and don't have to put a lot of effort. I get my paycheck, you know, it's not hard for me to learn my paycheck. It's a lot harder for me to learn, you know, um, 
I was going to say something that you just look up in Google, and so it's actually learning's become a lot easier. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know we don't have that. And the first one, um, we're not in steady state. Uh, you need to read the unreadable appendix, um, and it will show you that we can say nothing about the not being in steady state. Um, you give me some dynamics, I'll construct a model that will deliver it. Um, the, these models are very ill-behaved on the convergence path. Do we have more questions? Peter. Um, you cited retirement as an example at the start. One of the central facts of retirement is large fractions of people make no choice. And yeah. so the supplier has to create a default. So could you construct a theory given the diversity of the population and the default designer knowing something and how default the realization of the default is something I mentioned. I'm in the default, and I had 8% return last year. Um, and so maybe that leads you to go into the default, or maybe that leads you to do something relative to this. You could think of an optimization problem for a default designer. Yeah, I, I don't think this model captures that as well as one would like. The way this model would explain is a lot of people do the default, therefore people do the default. But when people have ideas of defaults, they have something else in mind, that it's more of a sin of omission than it is anything else. But it, it, it will show up in market share. It will, it will but I and don't. It will be bouncing some particular others. Perhaps. I think that you still have to seed okay. the whole thing. So the way the model would explain it is this is market share seeded by the fact that it's salient and prevalent, and then it kind of stays that way because everyone else is doing the fault, they seem to be doing well, I'll do the default, that kind of story. But I think the fundamental thing that gets it all the way going at the beginning is that that was the default. And we don't have a theory of searching through lists or you know, effort to move off of a, you know, of a, you know, a bias towards a status quo or something like that. I, this is not a theory of everything. No, there might be some types I more think likely to end up in the default than other types. Certainly and that people will would then change the nature of the information so I guess I in would, the chosen shares. I would, I would, yeah, I think the way, so one thing you could do is you could have a cost of switching and then a cost of learning. And if there was heterogeneity in the cost of learning, you would imagine the people who found it easier to learn would learn, and then they would learn whether they should switch. Whereas other people would just throw up their hands, yeah. it's going to be really hard for me to learn, and then I'll just stay here with the switching cost. The, the other obvious question to ask of the model is, you've of course got no suppliers in the model. Yeah. So given suppliers' ability to manipulate um, market shares. I s tried to set you up for that for, next, for tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so manipulating market share is one way, right, that it gives a story about why firms might want to get big, because once you're big, I mean, you tend to look there first because you have limited attention. Um, the other supplier phenomenon would be just take advantage of people's uh, confusion. But are you thinking of modeling any of that? Oh, yeah. I, this, we're not here yet. That's in the future stuff. Supply side is in the future stuff. Definitely. So I was, I was also thinking about this endogenous supply and I mean you're emphasizing this manipulation exploitation but I, as far as I understood it the key inefficiency is related to the extensive margin. Key so inefficiency. If, if, you, if you have firms are advertising their products wouldn't there be huge you know say I have a killer product that nobody's buying wouldn't it have huge incentives to just advertise it and make sure to get out of that inefficient equilibrium. So I'm, I'm not so sure that adding the supply side you have to be able to make money along the way, but you might lose money in the short run, make it in the but long run. In your steady state, it's clear that in I the would. steady state, we have an equation that tells you exactly whether your prof your project will should be in the market or not, um, and uh, it's a simple entry condition. Um, it basically whether your the ex exponentiated utilities are above some constant. If that's true, you should be in. And if it's not, you should be out. So the extent that suppliers know, have the same information about utility that the demanders do, the guy should know that if he can get his product out there and get people to try it, it should survive in steady state, definitely. And it's a very simple equation. Who gets kicked out of the market is infinitely complicated. 
but whether this guy should be in the market is actually a very simple calculation. So could easily, we think, thought about writing models of entry and exit and uh, industry dynamics with, um, with ambi um, uncertain consumers. No, we don't. So your equation is My equation is whether they would make profits in the steady state. Then I would add to that the cost of, of trying to get to, to the steady state and the cost of advertising and increasing market share. And then you would know you'd have two calculations. I mean, you shouldn't ever try if you shouldn't be there in steady state. And then conditional on that, you say, OK, what's the, what's the entry cost? And does that entry cost justify being there? So it'd be slightly more complicated than what I, what I said, but not, not undoable. We have two okay. minutes. Okay. If there are no further questions. And I always forget to do this. Bertosz, thank you for your comments. <laughs> I wrote it here at the top so that I knew I would forget to say it. And I still forgot to say it. Thank you. And uh, let me thank both John and Bartosz for, uh, and, and all of you for an interesting session. So thank you. Thank you.